Good morning. Welcome to those of you who are gathered here in person as well as those who are gathering with us online. A few things before we get started. First of all, I hope you noticed how that mitten tree is just loaded down with mittens, and that's because we met our goal, and we've raised over $5,000 to help needy children at Christmas this year. In addition to the gift cards, those families will also be receiving grocery store cards uh, from us so that they can purchase food as well. I also wanted to let you know that our schedule for Christmas Eve is that we will have two brief outdoor services, one at 5 p.m., one at 8 p.m., and we'll gather there in a circle much the way we do on Sunday mornings after our services and we'll hear the Christmas story, we'll sing some carols together. Everybody's gonna have electric tea lights uh, so that we can be uh, sharing the light as we sing Silent Night. And there will also be about a half hour recorded service that will be posted on our website. So for those who choose not to come to one of those outdoor services, you will be able to participate in worship with us on Christmas Eve through the website. This week and next week, we are collecting for the United Church of Christ Christmas Fund. The envelopes are located on the offering table out in the upper narthex. That is a fund that provides uh, financial assistance to retired ministers of our denomination. Uh, Years ago, the pension was not nearly as good as it is now. And unfortunately, there are a number of retired ministers who really do struggle to make ends meet. And so that's a fund that's been collected to help deal with those situations. And we have folks who visit with them and make sure that they've got everything they need. And that's a resource that they can use to help fill in the gaps. Now, one last thing, Um, we are continuing with a recorded carol and a recorded Advent chorus. So you can at least hear singing when we're together for worship. This week we've also included the music so you can follow along and hum along. Feel free to do that. Let's begin our worship and be led by the music in a spirit of meditation. Please join me in the call to worship. The wilderness shall be glad, and the desert shall blossom. All flesh will see God's majesty and glory. Behold, God is coming to save the faithful. Joy and gladness shall fill our hearts, and sorrow and silence shall flee away.
Please stand for the lighting of the joy candle. Today, the Advent season culminates with the experience of joy. Joy, joy to the world, the Lord has come. The angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy for all people. Let earth receive her king. As the Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. This I have spoken to you so that your joy may be complete. Let every heart prepare in room. We have lit candles of hope and peace. Now we light the candle of joy. Heaven and nature sing. The peace of Christ be with you. Please be seated. Good morning. I have a bit of a problem this morning. I'm a little lightheaded. Now, I will tell you that every time when we would go camping for scouts or as a family, every time I dig this out, just ask my wife and kids, I crack that same corny joke every single time. <laughs> but today, as we've heard, is the third Sunday in the season of Advent, the, the Sunday where we celebrate joy. And uh, what brings people joy these days? Uh, a number of things. One of the things that brings us joy, we haven't seen much lately, and that's the sun, right? The sun brings a lot of people a lot of joy, especially this time of year. And the sun is mainly used for two reasons, right? Number one, to heat things up. And what's the second thing the sun does? Lights up the way, right? And... If we didn't have the sun, we would obviously live in a world of darkness. And God has told us in the, God's word that he doesn't want us to live in the dark, that God wants us to live in the light. And God is the light that we'll hear about in today's gospel reading. Uh, but there are various reasons. And God's light, God wants the whole world to see his light, right? Not just select few, everybody. And the problem in today's world is there's a variety of reasons where not everybody sees God's light, right? Maybe people don't believe. Maybe people just haven't been told about God. Or maybe they live in a country where they don't have the freedom to worship God, and therefore they don't see the light that way either. There's a number of reasons why many people in this world don't see God's light. Well, that's where my mirror comes into play and my, my light that I have on the top of my head. The lamp, or the light in this case, is God's love, right? And I can shine this wherever I want to, right? But if I point it in one direction, there's going to be certain area that doesn't get or receive that light, right? And that's where this mirror would come into play, right? If I shine the mirror and I turn it, the light's going to reflect off of that mirror onto the place where the light was not reaching. 
Well, that's what John talks about in today's gospel. John says, I'm coming to reflect the light. Okay, John says, I want to shine God's light onto other people. That's the message that John tells us today. And so, like John, this is where we come in. We're called to be a mirror in the world today, right? We are called to reflect that light that shines through us and within us. We are called to reflect or shine that light, to shine that love onto those people in our lives and in the world that don't get to receive that love. And then one day, God's wish will be fulfilled, God's dream will be fulfilled that everybody will receive God's love and God's light. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for sending us your son Jesus for this wonderful gift. Thank you for the light that you, that Jesus brings to this world. We know that there are many areas in this world, in our own community, that don't see God's light. Please help us to be the mirrors in this world. Help us to receive your love and take that love and take that light and reflect that upon those who we come into contact in our lives. For it is in your name we pray and everybody said, Amen. Thank you. In today's Hebrew scripture, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20, he promises that God's glory will be our light. So those in the West shall fear the name of the Lord, and those in the East his glory. For he will come like a pent-up stream that the wind of the Lord drives on, and he will come to Zion as Redeemer, to, the, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. In today's New Testament lesson, the Apostle Paul reminds us that God's light shines in those who belong to Christ, so that no matter what hardships we face, we reveal God with our lives. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Today's gospel reading is from the first chapter of John. I'm going to read verses 5 through 13. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, 
He gave power to become children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. A week ago, Saturday, Nathaniel and Alex and his wife Katie and I drove out to our family's favorite tree farm to cut down two trees, one for our house, one for Alex and Katie's apartment. We've been visiting the same tree farm for over 25 years, and this year it felt a little bit different, not just because it's under new ownership, but because there were so many people there more people than I ever remember being at that tree farm at one time. And that's probably because tree farms are enjoying a burst of popularity as a result of the pandemic. Lots of family traditions are suspended this year, but here is an outdoor activity for the whole family that is safe and fun. So there were lots of young families with children looking for the perfect tree for their living rooms. I have fond memories of these annual excursions out to the tree farm. When all our boys were little, it was quite a to-do, getting everybody under their snow pants and line jackets and boots and mittens. And mom always brought along a thermos of hot chocolate. And when the boys got older, frankly, they seemed a lot more interested in a good snowball fight than in finding the right tree, but it was still fun. The aftermath of the trip to the tree farm, however, has not always been so romantic. And I'm recalling a particular Saturday years ago when there was an event at church in the morning and there was another event at the church in the evening and Martha and I decided that between those two events, we would get our tree and decorate it. We were a lot more ambitious back in those days. Soon after lunch, we loaded into our van and we drove up to the tree farm. We found a nicely shaped seven foot Fraser fir and cut it down and brought it home and pulled into the driveway at 3.30. I trimmed off a few branches, brought the tree inside and set it up in the stand. And it's the custom in our family that before any ornaments go on the tree, dad strings all the lights. So I retrieved three strings of multicolored lights from the basement, plugged each string into the wall to make sure they worked, and when I saw that they were all fine, I started wrapping them around the tree. By 4.15, all the lights had been strung, so we started loading down the tree with ornaments that we had accumulated over the years, and actually we left most of them in the boxes because there just wasn't room for all of them. There never is, but Christmas music was playing on the stereo and the tree looked beautiful and the aroma of apple cider and cinnamon filled the house and snow was falling lightly out the bay window where the tree stood and just as the ghost of Norman Rockwell was getting ready to knock on the front door and ask for permission to come in and paint a picture of our living room, all the lights on the tree went out. <laughs> not one string, not two strings, all of them went out. It was 5.15. We were due back at the church at 7. I tried not to panic. With dispassionate logic, I deduced that the problem must be with the string that was plugged into the wall. So I fished through the boughs of the tree to where that string was connected to the next string and saw it was one of those strings that had that tiny little fuse box at the end. So I pried open the tiny little fuse box and I pulled out the teeny tiny fuse and the teeny tiny fuse fell through my fingers into the forest of tree limbs below and was hopelessly lost. Now it's 5.30, still not panicking. 
I have to go buy some lights, I said calmly to Martha. And I quickly put on my jacket and got the car keys and left the nearest discount department store, dashed into the store, and I found the Christmas light aisle. It was a crowded, noisy place. Tired children were crying. Exhausted parents were snapping at them to be quiet. Most of the shelves were empty. Boxes were strewn on the floor. Many of them had been opened. Oh, I found lots of strings of white lights and monocolored lights, but I had to search frantically to find three strings of multicolored lights. And once I had found them, I dashed to the front of the store, feeling pretty good about myself. Two registers were open, and a bright, friendly sign read, if there are more than three people waiting, we will open another cash register. There were eight people in both lines. The person making his purchase at the front of my line did not know the price of the item he was buying, and neither did the cashier who called for help on the intercom. In the other line, a woman was arguing with the cashier about the price of her item, and the cashier left the register to go find the correct price. 550. By the time I got home, it was 10 after 6. I rushed in, tore off my jacket, ripped open the box of lights, the first one. I unwrapped the lower string of lights from the tree, knocking off several ornaments in the process, wrapped the new string around the tree in its place and plugged it in. The bottom third was lit. The top third was lit. The middle of the tree was dark. Not to worry. In my cool, detached state of reason, I had planned for this eventuality. Remember, I purchased three strings of multicolored lights, so I unwrapped the middle string of lights from the tree, trying hard to ignore the beads of perspiration forming on my brow, as well as the sound of more ornaments crashing to the floor. I ripped open the second box of new lights and began stringing them, but after just one pass around the tree, I found the string to be knotted. And I felt at that moment a wave of panic beginning to crest. And now the sweat from my brow began to fall onto my eyeglasses, blurring my vision. I destrung the lights, untangled them, wrapped them around the tree again. And by this time, I could feel my soaking wet undershirt clinging to my body like shrink wrap. But the crisis was about to end. This time... All the lights came on together, and the tree was lit by 6.30, giving me enough time to change clothes and for Martha and I to get to the church by 7 o'clock. Well, as I was wrestling with all those multicolored lights, a thought occurred to me, all that business about light and darkness in the scriptures is probably lost on most of us. There I was holding this tangle of artificial lights in my hands. I was determined to fulfill my patriarchal role of lighting the Christmas tree. Not after I got home later that night, not the next day after church, but right at that moment. And even though it was a struggle, I got it done. I prevailed. I brought light to that tree through my own efforts using hundreds of synthetic bulbs. Our lives are full of artificial light that comes on at the flip of a switch. When it goes out, getting it back on is usually just a matter of replacing a bulb or in extreme cases, a circuit breaker. Don't get me wrong. I'm grateful for electricity, especially at this time of year when most of us are up well before dawn. Electric lights are really quite wonderful, but there's been a cost to harnessing light. We're so accustomed to having it that we don't even think about it. Light is all around us all the time. The flicker of screens, whether from your phone or your laptop 
or your television, headlights on cars, street lights, even all those little digital red and green dots and the digital clock readouts that are still burning after you've supposedly turned out all the lights. Think about this. Only four generations back, most people lived without electric lights because electricity had not yet been mass produced. After the sunset, gas and oil lamps provided the light. And in that sense, our great grandparents were closer to the time of the Bible than to the time in which we are living today. People who lived before electricity had a much greater appreciation for light than we do. They knew it to be a precious commodity. Farmers living in Scandinavia near the North Pole latched on to the biblical imagery of light and darkness because it made a lot of sense to them. Daylight in December and January was so scarce, there was no sense in trying to do any work. So medieval Scandinavian farmers began the tradition of taking the wheel off the wheelbarrow and bringing it inside, decorating it with evergreens and candles, a tradition that would eventually evolve into the Advent wreath. It was too dark outside to do any work, so they might as well use their work tools to bring light inside. Farmers in Scandinavia and elsewhere who lived before electricity knew that light was a gift. You can't make the sun shine longer than it does, so make the most of the daylight. And when it's dark, rest. They also knew the light from their oil lamps was precious. The elemental properties that produced that light were not invented they were discovered. All light was a gift. When the Hebrew prophets talked about light splitting the darkness or testified that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, or when the Gospel of John talks about Jesus being the light of the world that the darkness cannot overcome, they were speaking from the lived experience of total darkness. People of the ancient world and actually all the human race right up until the last century were well acquainted with total darkness. Darkness so complete that you could not see your hand right in front of your face. Because they knew the absence of light, they understood the meaning of true light. We, on the other hand, who have banished the darkness with an abundance of artificial light, have trouble understanding the value of true light. We miss the power of the image of Jesus as the light of the world. The true light that is Christ is different from any other light. It's not like the lights I string on Christmas trees or any other synthetic light. I can't switch it on and off. I can't make it happen. It's pure gift. The light of Christ is more like the flame of a candle or an oil lamp, but not quite. A candle flame can easily be blown out. Oil lamps depend on a supply of oil. The light of Christ is never extinguished. Now, you might say that the light of Christ is more like the sun, and that comparison has often been made, especially at this time of year when sunlight is so scarce and the lack of it affects our spirits. But even this metaphor doesn't always fit. The sun shines brightly and indiscriminately over all people and all things for part of the day, and then it sets. The light of Christ shines all the time, and not the way the sun does. The creation story in Genesis 1 tells us that God created light 
before God created the sun. So essential light is not the same thing as natural light. It's not an external light that comes to us from up in the sky. It shines through us. The true light that enlightens everyone. That is, shines from within us was coming into the world. This light shines through human beings. And that's why Jesus said in another gospel, you are the light of the world. And because the light shines through us, rather than flooding our lives from above, it does not banish the darkness. John wrote that the darkness cannot overcome the light, but notice John did not say that the light overcomes the darkness. The darkness actually has a role to play. Without it, we don't really appreciate the light. Going back to Genesis 1, when God created the heavens and the earth, God separated light from darkness. God did not banish darkness with light, but simply separated it from the light. Dark and light are both part of life. Like the season of Advent, there are seasons of life that are full of shadows that seem very dark to us. It's become fairly standard in our spiritual language to equate darkness with evil and light with goodness. And that makes dark times even more difficult for people passing through them. But it seems to me that while darkness is one metaphor for evil, not all darkness is evil. In fact, darkness provides the place where true light shines. And so, just like Advent, those darker seasons of our lives are times for us to be silent, to reflect, even to embrace our pain and know that God shares our pain with us. The darkness is not a place where God is absent. In fact, sometimes the most important place to meet God is in the darkness, for it is there in the deep shadows of grief and heartache and weariness that God gives us light. Not a bright LED lamp, not the blinding light of the sun, and certainly not an end to all darkness, but a flame from within that splits the darkness and gives us the ability to find our way. The true light that enlightens everyone was coming into the world, is coming to you. So let the light of Christ shine in you. Amen.
Let us join together in prayer. O God of life, who brings joy even to the desert and light to the darkness, we thank you for the wonder of this season. We thank you for the deep joy you have placed in us through our baptism and through community with other people of faith. We thank you that we are bound together with people across the ages and around the world who know the hope, peace, joy, and love that emanate from our salvation. Oh God, you are with us in times of abundance and times of scarcity, times of happiness and times of sadness, times of laughter and times of grief. Help us to seek you and to reflect your presence, your light, and how we live through all these times. And now we ask that you gather up the joys and concerns that each of us bring to this time of worship. Provide where there is need. Inspire where there is abundance. Give your blessing to all whom we lift up to you privately from our hearts in this moment of silence. We pray together in the name of Christ as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God most high. Let us thank God. It is right to give thanks and praise. O oh God, you have provided for all the worlds that ever were or will be. You have given yourself completely in love. If we go to the heights of the mountains, or if we make the grave our bed, you are with us. If we go to the depths of the sea, your right hand holds us fast. We thank you for Jesus, your word made flesh, who lived among us uncovering your presence. We thank you that you transformed his death into new life, not only for him, but for all who believe in him. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, leads us to serve you in the world, and guides us into truth. Hear us now as we give our praises to you. Holy, 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 holy God, God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God, God most high. We remember the night when Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room for the Passover meal, where Jesus took the bread, blessed, and broke the bread, and passed it among his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus also took a cup gave thanks and said, from now on, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you all. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Lord, Lord by, by your cross and, and resurrection, resurrection you, you have, have set us free. free. You, you are the Savior of the world. world. All are welcome to receive the bread and the cup. Please wait to be directed 
by our ushers down the outside aisles. There we will give you a piece of bread if you could lift your mask, take the bread there, put your mask down, proceed to the center where you will be given a sealed cup of juice. Please wait to partake of that until you're back at your seat. We'll do that together. And if you'd like a gluten-free cracker, that option is on the center table as well. This is the blood of Christ shed for us all. Let us now drink together. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Most loving God, thank you for your sustenance and abiding love. We offer our lives now in your service. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to stand with you, speak for you, and act in your name. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, it appears we have avoided the passing showers, and so you're welcome to join me to sing a Christmas carol out in the parking lot before you return home. Go in peace, be led in joy, and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.